Uh, hey everybody, so I'm, I'm Blair Bethwaite, uh, I'm a senior HPC consultant at Monash University. Um, so Lance and I work in the Monash e Research Centre, uh, and I guess this is kind of what we do. Um, we, we work on, on accelerating discovery and, uh, and a lot of co-design and integration with researchers around the university to use IT and HPC and, and those sorts of things. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit about a project that we've done over the last um, year and a half or so. I'll talk about the OpenStack bits of that quickly and then Lance will give you a flavour for some of the science that goes on on top of that. Um, so my role in the research centre is I, I run the team that, that runs our node of the Nectar Research Cloud. Um, so the Nectar Research Cloud, for those who don't know, is a community cloud for research in Australia. Uh, so if you have research credentials, you can roll up to Nectar and get an account on that cloud and start launching your own infrastructure on it. Um, that has seven nodes um, around Australia, uh, across about 10 data centres, over 40,000 cores. Uh, and the project that we're talking about today, M3, is actually provisioned through that infrastructure as well. So we leverage Nectar very heavily for that, uh, but as a like as a private zone, Nectar. Um, and and Nectar really established an, an OpenStack uh, an OpenStack ecosystem in Australia for research computing that started back in, in 2012. So fairly fairly early days of OpenStack. Uh, that this is the last the last thing on that that. The interesting thing, I guess, about the Nectar architecture is that rather than having a multi-region cloud, we have a, a single region with one set of APIs and dashboard that give you access to the infrastructure all over the country. Uh, so that, that makes, makes it significantly easier to use for our end users as well. Um, a few people will be smiling because that, that diagram needs a couple of tweaks on it. Um, <laughs> Well, and also there should be a node in New Zealand, right? Um, so the, the, the project that we're talking about here is a HPC-focused thing. Uh, Massive is the Multimodal multi Australian Sciences Imaging Visualisation Environment. It's a project that's run out of uh, Monash University. It's an NCI shoulder facility, as well as has partners, uh, you know, other partners that have their own dedicated share there too. Um, the Massive project is really a specialised facility for imaging and visualisation science. Monash has a very uh, imaging intensive research precinct, a lot of instruments. Uh, you know, you might know that there's a synchrotron across the road. Um, you know, that, so there's a few beam lines integrated with Massive there. Uh, and also, you know, we've got a, n a number of other interesting, uh, in interesting instruments, one of which uh, Lance will be talking about in Cryo EM. Uh, and there's a lot of new, very high data intensive imaging modalities coming along now that, that I guess the researchers at Monash are quite keen to be uh, adopting and playing with. And you know, those things, they, they don't stand alone. They, they actually need big computing to go along beside them as well to actually make that thing useful. Um, so the other thing about Massive is that it, caters to a lot of users that are also quite new to HPC um, because they I mean they're coming there might be really biologists or something like this they're not they're not used to that paradigm and so the massive project overall has got a focus on making HPC easier to digest for those users so things like uh, virtual desktops that are well integrated into into the standard HPC cluster service and that sort of thing are quite quite important for that project as well. Um, there's some of the vital statistics there. So recently it came, we came to uh, building M3, the third, third cluster of Massive. There's M1 and M2 exist already today, but now getting quite long in the tooth. Um, so that's, that's what this thing is. Uh, there's roughly half-half CPU, GPU based. Uh, when, when it was initially built, uh, there was a rack full of K80 nodes. We now have a rack full of P100 nodes. That are, well, they're about to get their P100s put in them. Um, and a few other lower-end GPU nodes to support those, some of those uh, low-end desktop workloads as well. 
uh, Alusta file system integrated as well. As I mentioned, the um, I mean the, those instrument processing workflows are very data intensive, so being able to get data into and out of the file system quickly is very important. That was one of the key design decisions uh, or areas that needed to be optimised when we built this thing. Um, so the other the other thing I wanted to mention is that. As you would have seen earlier when, when Flanders put me on the spot, um, is that I'm co-chair of the scientific working group um, in within the OpenStack user committee. Um, we did a little thing, uh, uh, released about 12, what, 6, 12 months ago now, I can't remember. Um, this little booklet, which sort of has a whole bunch of use cases from different areas compiled. Um, oops that so from from other big institutions I mean we're, we're featured in there as well as um, people like Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center NASA and so on look at how they've approached this integration problem with their you know some of some of these institutions they have a really big HPC they do it in a particular way but they need cloud on the side uh, others are actually using OpenStack to completely operate the underlay of the HPC system. Uh, others like PSC do interesting things such as they have their big Sloan cluster, they have an orthogonal OpenStack off to the side of that and users can actually submit jobs through Sloan, their queuing system, which will end up provisioning a node into a Nova node and giving them a VM on that node integrated into their environment with a guest which is actually running, you know, sort of their one of their SOEs, if you like, so it's integrated into their identity domain and all that stuff. It's not a typical IAS. You're not root on that box, for example. Um, so when we came to doing M3, we chose to do it with OpenStack through Nectar. Um, that, there's a number of reasons for that, um, one of which was this, this space um, has a lot of different heterogeneous user requirements. So this was never just about building a new cluster. Um, that was going to be one of the services that would be, you know, I guess the maybe the anchor tenant for this new new zone that we were building of our of our cloud infrastructure. Um, clusters need provisioning systems anyway, and Nova happens to be quite good at that. Um, and also, of course, I mean, OpenStack's a big focus for innovation um, and a good good bandwagon to be on in that regard. You know, for example, the I guess the next step for us there will be to deploy Ironic into that environment as well, so that because we have mixed bare metal in there too, so we want to be able to manage that in the same way. Um, yeah, a few other reasons there. Um, I want to cover quickly the key tuning stuff that you need to do for high performance workloads on OpenStack. Um, so there's, there's a number of different blogs and stuff out there on this. Um, particularly CERN have done a lot of work in this space um, and, and published some interesting articles. Um, but their, their workloads are also very, very specific too. Um, so, and Andrew touched on this in his presentation before as well, um, like the, the NUMA tuning stuff, and no doubt that Red Hat's using the same, um, the same techniques there with Nova to isolate NUMA and that sort of thing. So firstly, the CPU model, you need to be exposing all the good instructions that you've got on your nice new Intel or if maybe a Ryzen um, chip so that, so that you're not hiding everything um, for compatibility reasons with QMU. Uh, you want to be exposing CPU and NUMA topology, pinning virtual cores and, and pinning memory as well. Huge pages are quite imp important as well, especially as you move up into get uh, larger memory sized guests. Um, I've got some graphs and stuff for this, um, and disabling kernel consolidation features as well that will just cause noise, performance noise for your applications, so things like um, kernel same page merging, that sort of stuff. Uh, and also, you want to remove host networking overheads where you can, particularly, I mean, if you're using something like uh, bridge networking through Linux Bridge or um, well, any, any of those other techniques which really you're proxying data through the host OS then you're paying a la both a latency penalty there, which may be important. It sort of depends for HPC workloads. We're not too concerned about latency. We are concerned about it. But I mean, for file system access, you're more concerned about throughput. Um, and for latency is probably more relevant for larger simulation workloads. Um, 
But the other important factor there is also just the CPU overhead on the host. If you, if you talk to your parallel file system through the host, then you're paying a CPU tax on the host as well. And in fact, I mean, some of the other, some other users um, that run these sort of workloads on OpenStack, they reserve CPUs on the node as well. So, um, so, there's, uh, that, so there's a quick picture there. It's a bit of Malinox propaganda, really. Um, but you know, it's, it's actually, you know, these are correct numbers, so that's, that's fine. Um, that illustrates that difference. So what we did for M3 was used SROV to plumb into the, the, the data network for the cluster. And that gives you sort of like a logical view of that. Um, you know, so there's, these, these guys are bare metal nodes. Um, we used RDMA over Ethernet, Rocky V1, and that requires an L2 connectivity. So that's basically raw Ethernet. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why we needed this ROV2. Um, and so that passes up a virtual function directly up into the guest. Um, you, you do, you know, that's not, so that, that reduces the overhead hugely, um, as you can see from that diagram, uh, the, that graph. There is, a, there is an overhead for SROV though there, that costs you um, close to one microsecond, um, which would be significant for very small message sizes for latency, but pretty much disappears about 8K and beyond. Um, our network, Cumulus Fabric, um, we, so we did a data center move recently and, and switched over to, to Cumulus. Um, we were an early adopter of Malinox 100 gig ethernet for this project um, and, and then made the move over to Cumulus. Um, the, I guess the interesting thing in the HPC space is this is, so this is all ethernet rather than IB. Um, so when we stood this thing up, we did the benchmarks and so on. Um, it, it's important to point out too that this was, I mean, we're looking at a, a KVM environment here too, which is kind of a, I guess, a typical Nova install. Um, today, if we were doing this, we would probably start with Ironic, but when we built it, Ironic actually didn't have support at that point for multi-tenant networking. Um, it does today, so that's, that's fine, and that's why we'll be looking at it again later this year. Um, so we've got, I've got some benchmark numbers here. We did some Linpack performance snapshots. So these, these boxes are Dell R730s, uh, Haswell. Um, we run, uh, well, we're about to upgrade to, to Xenial, but it's a trusty host using Xenial kernel and Mataka Cloud Archive packages. So that's got QMU 2.5 and so on. Um, and some of those, those kernel features disabled, like I mentioned before. And on top of that, this is just a one big guest basically eating up all that system. Um, and that guest is running CentOS, which is kind of also typical uh, for the HPC environment. Um, so this is running high performance Linpack. Um, you can see here the green line is basically, uh, sorry, the, the orange line is what you would get if you didn't do any tuning work. Um, and you've got relative to one, so one is, one is the bare metal performance. Um, so, you know, that's, once you actually get up into large problem sizes, you're actually doing pretty well. Like we're already at 94% without doing any tuning. Um, this whoops here is what happens if you tune things wrong and actually pin your NUMA sockets to the opposite cause. Right? So don't, don't do that. Um, we, we also found some, some interesting problems with the, uh, the hardware locality library that's in OpenMPI, which when we initially did the tuning, didn't, for some reason, still haven't figured this out, didn't understand the virtual topology, or the topology it was seeing inside QMU, um, and so it wasn't pinning properly when, when we were running HPL. Uh, and then, the, so then we worked around that, and that, the blue line is what you get for the optimized. Uh, we also did the same thing using Intel MKI, uh, MKL Linpack, which is rather than an open MPI implementation, that's just a threaded version. Um, again, similar story. So, all good, right? Well, no. Um, so Linpack is really a micro benchmark. Um, you know, it gets, gets a lot of press, uh, but it doesn't really tell you what a user workload's gonna be like. And so when we started onboarding user codes, we found some codes that we're getting from you know in, inconsistent performance across different nodes and we couldn't tell why 
what we suspected pretty much straight away was that we hadn't uh, included using huge pages in the in the early tuning because we couldn't actually use huge pages with guests of like 240 gig of RAM. Um, turns out that there's a little problem there with when when the memory for the guest is allocated, that takes longer than 30 seconds here. And so QMU is still chugging away, single threaded allocating that memory. And Libvert says, oh well, 30 seconds, guest doesn't come back to me, kill it. Um, so we went back to that problem and so that we could do some more testing here and so then we enabled so for our smaller nodes we enabled static huge pages one gig static huge pages uh, and then we used transparent huge pages for the bigger bigger guys and redid some testing on those on the m3a nodes and then those are the specs there so these are dell 6320s um, and so this is the once we ran those Without the, without the huge pages, you see the yellow dots. And once you get up into the big problem sizes, then we started seeing some weird inconsistencies across the full suite of nodes. Um, and if you zoom in on that, that's what you see, that, like that middle line there from you know, a bunch of different samples, they drop off hugely for some reason, um, which seems to be related to once you get up to large memory pressure and uh, page table sizes, but once you back with huge pages, we're all good again. Um, so the other thing we do on M3 is GPU instances. I'm not going to go into much detail here. I do have actually specific like step-by-step -step instructions in these slides just because I thought I'd leave them there in case we can publish them later and people are interested. Um, these are all the things you need to do to, to do GPU instances with OpenStack today. Um, there's Part of one of the things I'm doing in the scientific working group at the moment is trying to make that kind of, I guess, spread that knowledge, and that's why I'm here today, for one thing. Um, but also gather information about what, what people have actually had success or failure with um, today as well. So that's kind of an active area of work at the moment. Um, there's the instructions. Um, I just wanted to mention the rough edges. So. If you do GPU pass-through stuff with OpenStack, then that means that your GPUs are passed through to the guest and the host can no longer see them. So you can't monitor them from the host. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that's potentially, potentially an issue. Peer-to-peer um, -peer GPU workloads, like CUDA peer-to-peer, -peer, um, that, that won't work on most hosts just out of the box. Um, interestingly, Mike from NVIDIA is here, um, and we've got a <laughs> we've got a partnership with with those guys. Um, and he ran up DevStack on a uh, what was it? Some super micro server that's got NVLink topology in it, and that all works nicely because the N NVLink um, takes precedence over PCI in the guest, and so away you go. Um, there is also some stuff here with like some of the I guess the, the intricate details in, in PCIe, access control services means that all um, PCI transactions are forced through the root complex, which actually explicitly blocks then peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so you <coughs> d can disable that. Uh, and there's also a bit of interesting stuff around another PCIe thing, which is address translation services, which is like an agent on the device, which will cache virtual memory mappings from the host and allow the device not to have to go back to the root complex or the, M the IO MMU to say, where am I DMAing to? And so it just does that. But if you think about it, that is potentially a security hole. Um, and there's also a few other special registers and stuff that, which, you know, the, the, the card is presumed to be um, a part of the overall node and yet you're trying, you, if you're doing a multi-tenant environment, then you're trying to actually segment that thing up. Um, so there's some interesting, interesting stuff there. Of course, if you're running a cluster, that's kind of fine because you have one tenant anyway. Um, uh, I mean, the yeah, driver support stuff is not very interesting. Uh, other interesting thing here is that OpenStack Cyborg uh, project is a, is a new thing that's been pr um, <coughs> suggested at the moment in the community, which is an accelerated management framework. 
um, which will make some of this uh, much more flexible and easier to implement as well. And now I'm going to hand over to Lance so he can quickly tell you some of the interesting science stuff that we do on this platform. Um, how do I exit? <coughs> no. Uh, where's the play button? Um, well, you know how to drive that, presumably. <laughs> This is good. Yeah, Hotcon is. <coughs> I love it when a HPC person uses the computer and then it's fine, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there, but we'll come back in a second. Okay, there we go. There we go. Down there. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> hey. Hey. All right. Let's get rid of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the science we do on our, uh, on our system. Um, uh, one of the things that we look at is angstrom scale microscopy. So the technique that they use that is cryo-EM. Um, this picture here is a creepy little tick. How many people have had a tick? Pretty much if you live in Australia, you probably had a tick. Uh, yeah, Queensland, sorry. I forget, down in Victoria, it's all safe down here. Um, <laughs> nothing kills you. Um, these little ticks here have a, have a protein inside them that has almost the same chemical profile as a drug that they sell for $500,000 a dose. So this particular drug is used for um, stopping your immune system from attacking your blood cells. So one of the, one of the groups that we work with, uh, Hans Elman's team, they, they're looking at imaging this particular protein and trying to make a version that doesn't cost $500,000 so people who actually need it can get treated. Um, one of the other things that they've done with this particular technique is take an image of Ebola. Everybody know what Ebola is? And it kills you very quickly. And this is how it does it. So the brown bit here is what your cells look like and the gold bit on the top there is what Ebola looks like when it's punching a hole through your cells. So this particular imaging technique was one of the first times that I actually could see how Ebola kills you. I love this thing. <laughs> can't, can't you see it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go with th th this one's a little simpler. So this is what gets collected out of the cryo EM machine here. Can anybody see anything? Yep, it looks like. So each one of those images is a movie that they collect out of this particular detector, and somehow you're supposed to figure out that there's a molecule in there. So this is just one of those images. Now, can anybody see any molecules inside there? Just to help, I'll point at one. Uh, see, I'm not right there. Okay. So this is where the data comes out of this thing. It's really difficult for them to figure out what they're actually looking at. So eventually they do a truckload of processing and I, they chew up every resource I have available. They produce something like this in the early part of their data. Now this is images of that molecule in different directions. Okay. And then what they do is they do some back projection on these images and turn it into a molecule. And hopefully, I have a, I do have a picture of one that they've done here. Okay, so the the way that they do this is up the top, they fire an electron beam through their sample, hits the molecules, they take little images. This one here is very pretty. I like how they chose this one where you can actually see something. Right. Then they do some mathematics on this thing, and out pops a, an image where they they can look at what this molecule looks like. So that's the images that you saw produce that. So that's an image of some proteins that are in your immune system and that's the bit that cuts through the bacteria when your immune system detects it. That ring at the bottom is the bit that cuts them into pieces. That's how it was described to me by a biologist. I'm an engineer. <laughs> so it's a reasonably annoying problem. We have lots and lots of files, so about 5,000 files one to four terabytes, so it really smashes your file system. Um, it is a pipeline analysis, meaning that you have to do lots and lots of steps. They go back and forth and around and around, and they have different compute requirements for every step of this process, which is fantastic. Um, you need monster GPUs, you need a lot of memory, so the last job I did needed over 240 gig to process. It was tricky on our system. <laughs> lots of compute cores, and if you do have a parallel file system like we do, it absolutely smashes it. One job will take all of the bandwidth. So don't volunteer for this one. Um, right, why do I want to use OpenStack for this workflow? 
primarily because of so many steps. What I want to do is I want to divide up how I use my compute resource so that I use the most appropriate part for that particular step. Because there's so many steps and you go round and round and round in a loop, I think the last job I looked at 100, 128 steps or something and they're only about three quarters of the way through the process. That's lots of different requirements over the course. Um, the other reason for using OpenStack is this. The, one of the first communities to do this type of processing has put up an image into AWS. So you, if, you're, if you've just collected one sample, you can fire up a VM and away it goes. It's actually really fast too. Not as fast as ours. <laughs> Thanks to him. And me whinging a lot. Um, do I want to cover those? Um, yeah, so one of, the things, one, of the, one of the things that we do in the system is the, the first lot of images where you can't see anything, basically they take an average of those images so they can produce a single one. Now that is done in a GPU and the only way to do that fast is by having monster amounts of GPU. So on a desktop it takes a couple of hours and on our system it takes less than five minutes now. So a problem that when they're collecting the data they need to look at it quickly by a, by running that step on our, cl on, our, on our cluster now, you can get that down to five minutes, which means they can actually see something useful. Um, it, like I said, that particular step there, when you take five or six nodes, completely takes all the bandwidth for Lustre. All right. um, one of the other things we do in our cloud is uh, we, we provide lots and lots of GPUs. Um, so one of the steps that they run on this particular analysis can benefit from multi-node. Um, so for us now, we typically suggest people run 16 GPUs, which you can't do in a single box. Um, I say that without special purpose hardware. Um, so what we're now down to now is we're, we're dramatically reducing people's time from when they collect the data to them having a result where they could see if you had the next thing, that next level four pathogen that's not Ebola, you could actually scan it and see what it is almost in real time. Um, and I'm going to kill myself in just a second. Uh, so just to show off a little bit, um, this is some data that the developers provide for this particular piece of software. Um, and now I'm even faster than this because I haven't updated the slide. Um, but you can see the two little white boxes down there. That's how fast that you can do this particular job in the cloud if you want to. <laughs> uh, look. That's the guy who develops the software. He was really excited that we'd done something actually useful. <laughs> Weird. Weird. No, I won't talk about that. All right. Uh, I do want to thank everybody who's helped me collect the results on this. It wasn't done by myself only. Um, they were very, very helpful. Actually, Jafar, is he here? Hooray! He's been very helpful. All right. Um, now, I'm happy to answer any questions on the stuff that we've done. Technical, I mean, if you, if you want to know about how we configured our cluster and how that relates to the cloud, or if you want to know about creepy science stuff, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, to mention, if you're interested in the HPC on OpenStack stuff as well, um, Lev from Uni Melbourne is giving another talk, I think, at 12.30. 12.30 a.m., I think it says, actually. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, it's going to be a very long talk. Um, but go and see that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Sure. What's, what's the learning curve like for this kind of stuff? <laughs> The question is, what's the learning curve for this type of stuff? What, uh, <laughs> supporting it. Um, uh, I'm a uh, mechanical engineer by training, so I, I've been doing lots of simulation stuff over the years. Um, the learning curve to, for this has probably taken about six months. Um, every time you think you've solved a problem, someone else comes along and they go, this doesn't work, and you, you go back and you go, oh. Why is that not working? Uh, it's been tricky. <clears throat> Don't volunteer for it. I think I was the slowest moving target. I agree. Uh, the require image, does it have uh, local processing before it actually goes into the cloud? Uh, the question is, do, you, do, we have, do they have local processing in the cryo storage uh, ours doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean that others around the world don't. Um, we have very tightly integrated that into our system. So basically it's directly attached to our storage and they have 
um, nodes that they can see, they can bring up a desktop and start processing their data immediately. Um, we've gone to a lot of effort to make sure that their data hits our system as soon as possible and they only process on us. 